Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation today. This is ISO 9001-2015, Knowing What to Expect to Ensure a Stress-Free Audit. My name is Joseph Krolikowski. I am the QMS Program Manager for Perry Johnson Registrars. Couple of notes for our participants today. All of you are on mute, but we will definitely take your questions. If you'd like to utilize the question portion of the dashboard, uh, I will address questions at the end of the presentation. One of the more common questions that we get is whether or not the presentation will be made available after we're finished. We do make our webinars available in two key ways. Uh, firstly, if you'd like to get a copy of the slides, those are available for download direct from our website. Uh, just look for the link entitled training. And if you'd like to rewatch this webinar, uh, we do post all of our webinar recordings to our YouTube page, and that can also be accessed through our website. Again, look for the link entitled training and follow to where it says previously recorded webinars. Now our topics for today, we're going to be kind of unpacking ISO 9001 and addressing uh, its characteristics, what makes it uh, what it is in terms of how the standard was written. We're going to talk very briefly about how this presentation was put together, and we're going to unpack from there some of the key areas that come up during an audit. And uh, I'm going to take these kind of one at a time and give you some um, summary expectations of what uh, it means uh, to be prepared. So let's uh, let's begin here. So ISO 9001 uh, has to be recognized as an interpretive document. Uh, when the 2015 version was published, it was the first version to have an explanatory appendix. If you look at Annex A, uh, there is uh, some uh, an eight-part uh, explanatory section where they kind of unpack some of the requirements. Now, since then, uh, it has had a separate supplemental standard uh, that was published. So let's talk about that for a second. Uh, this came a year later, uh, and it was known as the TS, or Technical Specification 9002. Now, the ISO 9002's full title is Quality Management System Guidelines for the Application of ISO 9001. So this is officially sanctioned guidance uh, from the organization that actually wrote the standard. Now, if you uh, have been around ISO long enough that you remember the 2000 version of 9004, it kind of takes a similar tact to how it's been uh, organized. Now, because ISO 9001 2015 is an interpretive document, we have to acknowledge that there is no perfect way to implement it. There's a lot of different ways that you can approach all of the different requirements uh, from ISO 9001. So our, our, the auditor's role, the auditor's job, is to look at what the organization has done and make a judgment call, make a, uh, uh, make a decision as to whether or not what the organization is doing truly fulfills the requirement. Now, one item I always like to mention, and I, I like to arm our clients with, with information, is the ISO 9001-2015 version uh, does not require any procedures. And this was kind of the, the fulfillment of a step down, if you will. Now, if you go back to the first and second edition, there were 16 required procedures. There were six under editions three and four, and now we have zero. Uh, but if you choose to have a procedure or a work instruction, you have to remember that what you've written into that procedure or written into that work instruction is subject to audit. And that's based on the definition of audit criteria. Audit criteria is defined as policies, procedures, or requirements used as reference against which evidence is compared. So if you choose to have a procedure, that's fine, uh, but we will hold you accountable to it in the context of the audit. Now, uh, ISO 9001 2015, uh, at this point, I, I can see I've got a bit of a misprint here. It's been in print now eight years. 
Uh, it has been around for eight years, and we're closing in hard on 40 years uh, for ISO 9001 itself. Uh, so it's it's been around a long time. Um, but what's funny is the same things seem to come up year after year in the ISO 9001 audits. You would think at some point the word would get around that this is the sort of stuff that the audit teams are looking at and looking at carefully. Now, our data sampling on this originally went back to 2018. We have since supplemented uh, this data sampling and, and the results are the same. Uh, the five areas in ISO 9001 audits that get cited the most often, number one, at the top, management review, followed very closely by internal audits, then quality objectives, then matters related to measurement devices, and finally, external provider approvals. Now, three of these items, the requirements related to calibration, internal audit, and management review, these are all legacy items. These are all items that have been part of ISO 9001 going all the way back to first edition uh, back in 1987. So that this is definitely not new stuff uh, that we are sampling. Now again, uh, it is an interpretive document, what we're talking about here. And uh, as a certification body representative, I'm not allowed to officially tell you what to do. Uh, I, what, I'm, what I am allowed to do, what I will be doing over the next several slides, I'm going to provide you with some common interpretations and some common fulfillment techniques. Um, none of what I'm about to present is an official endorsement of approach and cannot be used as justification uh, within any circumstance as part of a nonconformance. So we are going to give you uh, some details on filing a dispute a little bit later in our presentation. So let's start with management review. As I said, this was the number one uh, most cited item in our research. Now management review, the requirement uh, from ISO, it says, firstly, that the management review needs to be conducted at planned intervals. And that's kind of the key focus point from this part of the requirement. You have to have some manner of controlling the frequency and the content of the management review meetings. They need to be planned. Um, now, what those controls are gonna be, well, that's up to you. Could be an internal schedule, could be a procedure, could be an automated reminder, could be a combination of the three. Uh, but they have to be planned. Secondly, uh, and this is more verbiage from ISO 9001 itself, uh, we have all of these lists of items of things that need to be discussed. And as you can see, it's, it's a rather extensive list. All of this is mandatory content within the management review meeting process. Now, I wanna emphasize all of it is mandatory, but you don't have to discuss each of those talking points at every single management review meeting. You are definitely allowed to have the meeting in small bites, if that's something that you wish to do. Um, some organizations choose to have PowerPoint presentations uh, to present the management review content. That's fine, it's not mandatory. Some organizations choose to use a standardized agenda format uh, to make sure nothing's missed. That's also fine, and it's also not mandatory. Again, it's gonna be up to you to decide what the controls are gonna to be to make sure that your management review meetings cover all required topics. Lastly, uh, the standard requires that the management review include decisions and actions, and that there be, as the standard says, retained documented information. That means records. We have to have evidence that the management review meeting took place. Now, what that evidence looks like, it's totally up to you. And also, let's not skip past this business about decisions and actions. The management review meeting is supposed to be a productive event. Uh, it's not just a churn of information. This is um, uh, making some decisions about what we've discussed 
and taking actions based on what we've discussed. Let's continue with the second most often cited item, section 9.2, internal audit. Now, the first part of the internal audit requirement is very similar to management review in that internal audits need to be conducted at planned intervals. And I've also, as you can see, highlighted this business about whether the quality management system conforms. Hang on to that uh, for the next slide here. Okay, so as I mentioned, planned intervals for internal audits. You have to plan when these are going to take place. Now again, how it's planned, completely up to you. Could be calendar triggers, could be database scheduling, could be a schedule hanging on the wall of the president's office, uh, whatever it needs to be, but they need to be planned. Uh, also, if you wanna do the internal audit all in one shot uh, at, at once a year, that's fine. If you wanna do it in small bites, that's fine. Uh, part of what you're supposed to do is react to what's going on in your system. If things are going great in one area and not so great in the other, you want to try to focus more of your internal audit resources in the area that's not doing so well. Also, I made a point of mentioning this business about uh, the requirements of this international standard. This means that you need to make sure that all of the requirements from ISO 9001 are included in the internal audit process. And that means the internal audit process itself. So uh, if anyone's ever told you, you have to do an audit of the audit, that's true. You have to make sure that the internal audit process itself is subject to an internal audit. Now I wanna work our way back to this business about uh, that the audit has to be performed against the quality management system. Remember, ISO 9001 requires that a quality management system is made up of processes. Uh, I've provided a clausal reference here from 441. You shall determine the processes that are needed for the quality management system. So the expectation is that you are going to structure your internal audits with respect to the processes that make up the system and not the clauses of ISO 9001 itself. You should be doing a process-based internal audit. The second part of the requirement from ISO 9001 kind of takes you through the execution of the audit itself. Talks about establishment of a program and criteria and scope. And I've got some highlighted items here uh, that I want to kind of unpack and talk about what these mean. Firstly, uh, there are no minimum requirements for auditor competency. Any, uh, uh, any internal auditors that you nominate, it's up to you to decide what it means uh, for that internal auditor to be competent. If that means that they've gone to uh, an internal auditor training course, well, that's fine. If it means that they've attained the competency some other way, that's also fine. Uh, Bear in mind, you have to have uh, records of this. You have to determine competency requirements for your assessors. Uh, another item that we like to point out, uh, a lack of responding to internal audit nonconformances. Remember, when you write a nonconformance within the internal audit process, you have to respond to it. And you have to treat it as closely as possible in the same manner that you would a nonconformance that's been written by Perry Johnson registrars. That means you're doing both correction and corrective action. Uh, also, you have to have evidence of the internal audit process. In other words, uh, you have to have some means of showing here's how the audit was carried out. Now, whether that's checklists or procedural printouts or, or something else, well, that's again, that's up to you but the records of the internal audit need to be sufficiently detailed to give confidence that that entire quality management system was assessed. And also, bear in mind that means evidence of conformity, not just a pile of nonconformances, but a pile of evidence. What did you look at during this audit? 
Now, one of the points I always like to make as it pertains to internal audits, remember that if you use a consultant, which you, that's completely fine, bear in mind the audit is still your responsibility. It's still your responsibility to schedule the internal audit, maintain the audit records, etc. You should absolutely be prepared to speak confidently about your internal audit process. Uh, this is not a, a case of you point to the consultant and say, that's his job. It is your system. It is your internal audit process. Let's move on with the uh, next most often cited item, and that is quality objectives, section 6.2. Now, quality objectives, uh, the requirements talk about uh, that they have to be measurable, that they have to be relevant, and that they have to be monitored, communicated, and updated. So let's unpack what that means. They have to be measurable. Uh, you know, if you don't have measurability, there's no reliable way to determine if the requirement has been met. Now, you're absolutely allowed to have variable type, uh, excuse me, attribute type objectives. That's fine. Uh, variable type objectives are more common. Now, this business about relevancy to product services and customer satisfaction, this was a new idea when the 2015 version was published. Now, please note, it's completely okay for you to have objectives that touch on areas like profitability or safety or whatnot. Uh, those are fine, but you still need to make sure that you have objectives that touch on uh, products and services and customer satisfaction. Those are key. Uh, and this is an, uh, an area where we expect everyone in the organization to have the ability to demonstrate knowledge and awareness. Now, uh, how you get there is up to you. If it's placards, if it's meetings, what have you. But the quality objectives, much like quality policy, this is something that an auditor can ask any person at any time, because that's how the requirement is written into ISO 9001. Also, uh, you'll note how the standard says that you need to determine what will be done. And 9002 provides some clarification on that. They say that this means you need to determine the actions that need to be implemented to achieve your quality objectives. In other words, it, it's not enough to just have the objectives and hope you make it. You have to kind of figure out how are we going to get there? How are we going to climb this mountain? Now, the key takeaway from part two of the requirement is that you do have to track progress achieved towards them, and you have to take necessary action to improve quality objective performance. Now, that means an appropriate response. It doesn't necessarily mean corrective action, but it means that if you're not hitting your objectives, you can't just say, oh, well, and move on. You need to say, okay, here's what happened. Here's what we're going to do about it to try to improve um, our performance. Let's move on to the next item, and that is monitoring and measuring resources. Now, for a lot of you, you probably call this requirement calibration. Um, monitoring and measuring resources, that is kind of a catch-all term. That's any device, tool, gauge, meter, scale, or similar item that is used for performing monitoring and measurement of outputs, uh, what most folks call inspection and or testing. Now, the requirements for this area, this item, come from section 7.1.5. And again, there are two subclauses. Firstly, uh, the most important item here, you shall retain appropriate documented evidence as evidence of fitness for purpose of the monitoring and measurement resources. So again, we're talking about records here. Primary requirement, is this business about retaining documented information. So this is gonna be calibration and or verification records for all of your measurement devices. Now, what's in those records? For that, we have to look at the second part of the requirement. So under the second part of the requirement, there's a lot of information that's provided. It says that your measuring equipment needs to be calibrated or verified 
against national or international measurement standards, needs to be identified, needs to be safeguarded from adjustments, and you will need to determine the validity of prior results if something is later found to be unfit for purpose. So let's unpack the key aspects here. The, the two most often violated aspects of this requirement. Firstly, this business about required traceability to national or international standards. Now here in the United States, that is going to be in almost all cases, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, AKA NIST. So if you've ever wondered what NIST stands for, that's what it means. Now, NIST has got measurement traceability uh, techniques for just about everything you can think of. But there are rare instances where they don't have something that's officially provided. And in those cases, it's considered acceptable for the calibration to be provided by the device manufacturer. Also, it is mandatory that the measurement devices be uh, identified in order to determine status. Now, please listen to what I'm about to say. This does not mean calibration stickers. I had to actually explain this uh, to one of my auditors, one of my newer auditors recently. So calibration stickers are not mandatory. What is required is that there be some form of device identification that permits traceability to the calibration records. Now, what that is and what that means, again, it's up to you. But calibration stickers are not required. I will tell you that much. Lastly, we have external provider approvals. Now, in the older versions of ISO 9001, this referred to suppliers, subcontractors, outside partners. All of these groups have been pooled together now under the heading external provider. Now, uh, the requirements for what it means to manage uh, external providers, uh, these are found in 8.4.1. And as I mentioned earlier, these are not new requirements. These are not new ideas. So firstly, you are required to apply criteria for the evaluation, selection, monitoring, and reevaluation of external providers. And also, and please pay very close attention to this point, you shall retain documented information of these activities. These activities, that's very key. And I'm gonna point out why on the next slide here. Now you are required, as I said, to have a methodology for external provider approval. Now what that is, uh, totally up to you. Uh, you. And also, you are allowed to have more than one type of technique. Uh, if you have one technique for evaluating raw material suppliers and another technique for evaluating everybody else, that's fine, long as you are applying that consistently. Um, you will note that it calls for reevaluation. So it's not evaluate and forget about them, it's evaluate and then have a protocol for reevaluation. Also, and I made a point of emphasizing this, it talks about evaluation activities that these need to be on the record. Now that means, in plain English, having the external provider's name on a list is not evidence of evaluation. It does not constitute a record of the evaluation activity. Just because they're on a list doesn't tell me, doesn't prove to me that you did an evaluation. Right? That's why I emphasize that verbiage. Okay, so we've gone over the five most common uh, areas for nonconformance. Let's unpack a couple of other requirements that stand out as uh, occasionally problematic for companies that are new to ISO 9001. And let's start with risk. Uh, the term risk is actually used 16 times in the auditable portion of ISO 9001-2015. Now, when this term was uh, first uh, released, when this concept was first uh, brought to light, the idea at the time was, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea at the time was this was going to be a system-wide strategy. Um, this was going to be something that was going to impact all areas. Um, so uh, very much like continual improvement. 
So, uh, but they also made a point to say, you don't have to have a formal risk management process. And uh, the idea is that uh, you're gonna uh, have a, a process for avoiding risk in all the various areas of your system. So let's unpack what they actually require for this. In 611, it says that you need to consider the issues from 4.1, which means those that come from both inside and outside the organization, and the requirements referred to in 4.2. Now, they mean in that context, both internal and external interested parties, and then determine the risks. And they, they give this kind of two point uh, um, analysis here. They say that you want to enhance good things, that's subclause B. You also want to prevent bad things, that's subclause C. And then the big picture is achieving improvement. So risk is not just the avoidance of negative events. It, it's, it's viewed as kind of a two sides of the same coin, so to speak. Now in 612, the uh, standard requires that you plan actions to address the risks and opportunities that you've identified and then implement those actions into your existing processes. So again, you don't have to have a special standalone risk management protocol uh, to meet this requirement. Now, when they talk about actions to address risks and opportunities, I always like to point out the verbiage from 9002, from ISO 9002. Uh, they break it down into five possibilities. You could avoid the risk. You could stop doing the process in question. You could limit the risk. You can do things like have special training or writing up procedures and so forth. You can share the risk. You can, for example, work with customers on, on bulk buying of raw materials. You can transfer the risk. You can do things like having insurance. And when you've done all of that, you accept the risk that remains. Uh, you kind of accept that there is a, uh, a certain level of remaining residual risk that is acceptable, uh, that further investment is not warranted for. Now, in terms of how we audit this requirement, this is probably what you're most interested in. We have taught our auditors to ask about it and be prepared to listen to what the client tells us and what the client shows us with an open mind. And again, this just like everything else, this is something we expect you to be able to speak confidently on. And it's important you know, to point out that there's only one requirement in ISO 9001 that mandates any kind of records pertaining to risk actions. If you look at the management review requirement, I've got the clauses uh, highlighted on the screen here. Uh, the only part of the standard that requires any kind of records uh, related to risk actions is that they be discussed within management review. And management review, of course, has to be on the record. That's mandatory. Let's shift now to interested parties. This is another um, this is another item that uh, was new when the 2015 version of ISO came out. Um, Clause 4.2 requires that you have a uh, a process for determining what your uh, relevant interested parties are. I should say who your relevant interested parties are. And the intent is that you need to figure out where the inputs to your quality management system are coming from. And uh, the, when they wrote this term, when they came up with this term interested party, it was meant to kind of broaden the scope of who those requirements might come from. Now, making sure that you're cognizant of applicable requirements, obviously this is good business. Um, but the, the uh, intent is that you're gonna figure out who your interested parties are. Now up at the top, I've provided the official definition. This comes from uh, Annex A of ISO 9001. This is any person or organization that can affect, be affected by, or perceive themselves to be affected by a decision or activity. Now I'm gonna hold off on going through the examples because we have a more complete list of examples uh, in 9002. 
Now, one point that needs to be emphasized here, in most circumstances, it's going to be inappropriate for the organization to conclude that their only interested party is their customer base. So if the organization comes back and says, it's just our customers, well, we are going to challenge that a bit. We're gonna say, okay, what process did you employ to conclude that the customers were the only relevant interested party? Now, if there is no evidence of a structured analysis having been performed, then presumably the process by which the interested parties were selected was flawed and potentially a nonconformance needs to be issued. Now, as I mentioned, 9002 provides an extensive list of possibilities in terms of who the interested parties might be. Uh, up at the very top, obviously customers, but it could also be end users. If you're making an interim product and your customer is an interim manufacturer, somewhere along the way, there's an end user involved. Could be the ownership of the company, could be external providers, could be your competitors, et cetera. Uh, this list is meant to kind of tickle your brain a little bit, get you thinking about who the possible interested parties are going to be. Now, what should you do to figure out what these interested parties want? Well, the, the, the activities, all of these activities, quite frankly, are things that you are already doing. Uh, you're already reviewing your orders. You're already participating uh, in uh, relevant associations, presumably. You're already conducting customer surveys. You're already monitoring customer needs and so forth. So um, you don't have to do anything special or extra to address this requirement. You just need to be prepared to speak confidently on, okay, uh, here's how we concluded who our relevant interested parties were, and here is uh, what we have done to monitor their requirements. And that's it. Now, there is a possibility, obviously, that nonconformances can be written, just like anything else in the standard. The two clauses that are in play here, firstly, are going to be 4.2. If we have no evidence or limited evidence, uh, of an implemented process for monitoring and reviewing information. That would be a violation of section 4.2. And secondly, if there's no evidence of interested party feedback being discussed, uh, that would represent a violation of ISO clause 932C1. Now, one more area I'd like to unpack with you is section 5.1. Uh, there are some exacting and crucial requirements pertaining to leadership. Now, we have uh, approached the concept of leadership very carefully here at PJR. One of the things that we've done is we've instituted an activity within our audit called the leadership interview. Uh, this leadership interview is intended to make sure that leadership is directly involved in the management of the quality system. And it's a group interview, and it should be with the primary management of the company. Now, these questions that I've got on screen here, these are the actual leadership interview questions. We talk about accountability. We talk about participation. We talk about interested parties. Uh, we talk about internal and external issues. Now, one of the concerns that we have is if we have an organization that is uh, any bigger than just a few people, so if we're talking 10 people, 15 people, 20 people, 50 people, if we see a leadership interview that was conducted with one person, that is a red flag, that is a concern. How could it possibly be that the leadership of the company, the leadership of the quality management system, is a single person in a company of this size. Uh, so we, uh, we question our auditors very carefully about those situations. So when your auditor says, can I have the leadership group, they mean the people that run the company, not just the person at the tippy top, but the leadership of the organization. Now, 9002 
also provide some uh, guidance on this concept. They talk about although certain authorities and responsibilities can be delegated, accountability remains with top management. Now, some of you may, may remember a time when there was a uh, an appointed party called the management representative. You can still have a management representative, that's fine. But understand that because you have a management representative, that does not excuse leadership from being involved in the quality management system. They, there, there definitely has to be evidence of involvement. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, um, it it does occasionally happen that an, uh, a non-conformance is written and uh, the client does not agree with the non-conformance. And that's, uh, that's completely fine. We have a process uh, called a dispute process, dispute appeal process. And this is all explained in our procedure Pro 10. Pro 10 is a public domain document. If you go to our website, go all the way to the bottom, look for a link titled registration document download. Uh, you'll be able to download a copy of Pro 10 for yourself and take a look at it. Now bear in mind, if you are intending to file a dispute for a nonconformance, you must do so within 15 calendar days of the end of the audit. Uh, now we have a separate webinar that includes coverage of the disputes process called your ongoing relationship with PJR. So if you're if you're looking to learn more about disputes and how that works, I encourage you to check that webinar out. ISO 9001 is still the world's most utilized management system standard. There are just over 900,000 registered companies worldwide. And as I mentioned earlier, many of these things that get written into uh, non-conformances are entirely avoidable and come up time and time again. So it's my hope that this presentation will leave you feeling more confident uh, that things will go well on audit day. If you'd like to take a deeper dive into ISO 9001, we have a clause by clause primer course. And uh, uh, it's a, it's a takes you through the entire standard section by section. It's a very well received course and it is completely free. So if you'd like to sign up for that, go to our website at pgr.com, look for the link entitled training and you will find the registration uh, link for the clause by clause course. I'd like to invite you to tune in for one of our other webinars. We have a special webinar on just the concept of exemptions uh, and what can and cannot be excluded. We have a special webinar on the interaction of processes and how critical it is to define uh, what your processes are and how they interact with each other. And we've got webinars on a whole lot of other topics, corrective action, stage one assessments, other standards, and so forth. If you'd like to be kept informed of the latest news automatically, the best way for you to do that is to visit our website at pgr.com Go to the bottom of the page, enter your email address in the provided space and click subscribe. You will be opted in for automatic updates on news, new webinars, and other points of information. I do thank you for your time and attention to my presentation today. I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, everyone have a great day and uh, take care.